Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time Minimalist Run. And we had just finished uh, our last video right here at the Yawning Abyss, where I have fallen many times, let me tell you, playing this game for the first few times. I, I actually really hated that room, just as much as I think I hate this room, too, when I was younger, because this room, of my previous rooms, you have sort of a time limit, but not one that you can see in terms of numbers. It's this wall of fire that just continually comes after you, and I th I'm not sure what it does, but I think I think you get hit once, and then I think you either have to restart the room, or the wall of fire waits for you, and then kind of travels back a little bit, and then continues forward again after you've recovered. But either way, it's kind of nerve-wracking, just, just a little bit. Now, obviously, there's a nice little caged area, just randomly in the middle of this room here with a, I believe, a compass. Or a map. One of the two. The map. The map always seems to come first. Because the compass is the one that gives you all the locations of all the treasure chests and cool event places and things like that, so that would actually be more useful than the map. Which is funny, because back in the old days, it was kind of reversed in the original Legend of Zelda games, where the compass was not really widely useful. And it was more the map that was more useful than the compass, because the compass, all that did back in the old games, was show you where the boss was. Here, it shows you where treasure chests are, and special markers and locations, and all sorts of crazy things. But the compass is actually more important than the map. So it's interesting how that gets reversed from Ocarina of Time onward. Yeah, this is... <laughs> that was a close call. Just a wee bit. We're not quite done. We're going to have to go through the this part of the room again. But now instead of dropping down in front of the... In, inside the cage there, we now go up and there's a door right here that we can go through. And now we go back to the rolling boulder room, but now we're up higher. And we have more options to go for. Possibly more Gorons to save now. Quite a few places to go to, but first this seems really suspicious, and we'll come back to it. So we gotta work our way all the way to the far side of the room to get that other Goron. So I was right, there actually is four Gorons to save here in this particular room. Two, which are on the bottom part of the, the bottom floor. One that's on the top floor, and then one you can kind of get to through a passage that you can bomb, and we'll we'll get to that fourth guy in a second. But first, the third Goron. Oh, that could have been bad. I could have been right back down onto the rolling boulder floor. My question is, how the heck did they get the Goron up here? And just shove him into this cage up high up in the wall. How the heck did that happen? That's a quasi-good tip. I'm not sure where that applies, really. Or where it applies specifically. Now we travel back to this particular floor that looks mighty interesting. I guess you can't really tap it with your sword, but it looks obvious enough that you can bomb it. Again, when I was younger and more daring, I would drop huge swaths of this wall and then catch right before I hit the ground. It's kind of a cool technique, sped things up a little bit. I think that's all the Gorons you can uh, save on this particular floor. You have to go higher up in the dungeon to save any more. Ah, yes! I think this is the last Goron you save right before the mini-boss. So, of course, this one is going to tell you about how to beat the mini-boss. 
You're gonna have to beat him with bombs. Seems like everything in this dungeon's all about bombs. Because that's what Gorons are all about, right? They're all about their special crop. I mean, if you compare these particular dungeons that they created for Ocarina of Time to later dungeons found in Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, things like that. It seems like they're not as coherent and cohesive as some of the later dungeons found in the series. The 3D dungeons, that is. Because I feel like they were still trying to figure out their niche. They were trying to figure out their mojo in designing dungeons for 3D in Zelda. So there was a lot more freeform elements to these dungeons that, in hindsight, doesn't really make too much sense. And this is me not remembering how the heck to get up there, and me failing, and now we get to... Uh... Okay, so that is exactly what happens when you get hit by the wall of fire. You get hurt, and then it goes back a little ways, and then restarts. So it's not the instant death type of wall that you were expecting. So, in essence, it's really not that nerve-wracking. I mean, when you first encounter it, you're like, oh gosh, run, run, run! But once you get hit by it a couple times, you're just like, oh, this is just annoying. So your whole attitude and perspective on it changes. Oh, so this must be the pillar that we saw uh, Darunia under. And that keys is really too close for comfort. I didn't even know that guy was coming. Now this maze, oh this fire maze, let me tell you, I remember dying in this area many, many, many times. And the problem with that is, is because there's just so many false, look see, it, they don't, the fire between the pillars doesn't even sprout up until you get really, really close. By then it's too late, you're, you're either committed to, <laughs> barreling head on into the flames or you're, yeah. Or you just stop right in the nick of time. So obviously we can't really go any further that way. Not doing good. Not doing good at all. I chose poorly which way I was supposed to go. I was actually supposed to go through this way. So now, with less health than ever before, it's me taking it real slow. Don't really want to get hit by any flames. My goal is that key, that, that locked door. But getting there, up. Oh, this is me getting sidetracked. I saw some pots. And I'm getting smacked in the face horribly for trying to go after those pots. Because I'm hoping beyond hopes there might be a fairy or some hearts here. Uh, of course. Going after the pots uh, sets off traps. Which I fall for not once, but twice. Who here has fallen for that stupid trap? Because it's an awful trap. Alright, now that I can see where <laughs> where I thought I saw where the pathway to the door was, we can now move on ahead. Gosh, this maze. I used to have that maze memorized down to a T. I, I used to have it memorized. Now I I'm still I'm trying to figure it out all over again for the first time again. If that makes sense. Stupid geese, man. At least they're good for hearts. That was close. Uh, it's not gonna be that easy. Yep. 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 <laughs> not easy at all. So let's kind of figure this out. Okay, so it's basically around and straight ahead. 
Not as hard as it seems, but if you go take the most direct route, you're going to get smacked in the face with flames. Now I was swinging these pots, because I was hoping one of them might uh, give me some bombs, which it did. So that was, that was useful. And two bombs, which is definitely what we need. And of course that tip about the swinging doors comes into play here. And now we get to our mini boss of this dungeon. The Flare Dancer. You must extinguish its flaming clothes first. Oh gosh! What am I doing? There we go! Obviously chasing after it, he's too fast. If you try and chase after it normally, he's gonna outrun you. So you're gonna have to go around the opposite direction and try and catch him. And this is me failing miserably, because I tried to... See, trying to do jump attacks on this thing is not going to work. Because he's too small, his hitbox is too wa awkward and wonky. You're going to miss him every time on a jump attack, and so it's not worth it doing the double damage. And if you fail in getting extinguished in his fire clothes before he starts dancing around the thing, he is very dangerous, actually. He actually makes an attempt to at literally try and hit you on each pass. And at this point, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to stop him. Because he just goes in a, in a circle and he doesn't seem like he's going to stop anytime soon. Well, that helped. So yes, point proven. He... I don't know what I'm doing right now. I don't even have my sword out. So point proven. He will continue to go around in a circle, dancing in a circle, whatever that is. And won't stop until you bomb him. Either if you get lucky by throwing at a bomb at him, perfectly aiming it, or if he gets caught in a blast as he's going around in a circle. So you'll want to smack him with the bomb. This is the easiest time to do it when he's st steady and still, and he's spinning around in a circle. So now it's just a matter of just going around the pillar, or the center of dais there, over and over, catching him unawares on each time. Doing a little dance, really. You're you're kind of dancing with him, if you think about it. You're dancing with the Flare Dancer. And you know that he's on the ropes now because he's blue flames instead of orange. And he actually takes a lot of hits for a mini-boss. Almost as much as the uh, actual boss itself. Ah, and he has green. That's the final color. Once he changes to green fire, then he's uh, he's on the ropes. He's on his last few hits. Oh, and of course, one last little trick. He explodes. If you don't get back in time, he will hurt you one last bit. And if that's your last bit of life, guess what? You still lost. <laughs> So now that we got that interesting boss out of the way, what do we get? More puzzles! That's what we get. So obviously we need to use that special trick with the crystal switch. We need to get up there, so we're going to need to get a timer. Although, you could still use the hookshot and still make it in time for this. The timer isn't that stringent. Not as bad as the previous one, anyway. Oh, yes. This room. You hit a switch, and the flames drop down from the big chest of the dungeon with the item in it. And you have to race up there before the flames come back up. And there's only one way to do it. That's not it! That is not it! Oh gosh, that hurts so bad. 
Oh, I think I cursed really bad right there. I, I think I really, really did. It was awful. <laughs> I just about was like, no. This is ridiculous. And I think I'm recording just a little bit further. I think I actually died here. Yep. There be my death. So with the splice cut ahead, we move ahead back to where we fell. The main, this is pretty much the top floor of the dungeon, all the way at the top. So, how many times did people try this? Because if you try and do the outside path, which is the safer and easier path to get to the chest, you're never going to make it. You have to take this interior path that's bordering the yawning chasm right below you. Oh my gosh! How many times did it take me to do just that that you just saw? I can tell you right now, off screen, that was my final attempt. I think that was my sixth attempt, this recording, that you just saw. The first attempt, of course, you saw me fall down and die. The other attempts I failed because I, I either slipped over to the other side or I fell down again and messed up. But how many people have had real trouble getting past that part, just getting to the stupid chest? I mean, has, I mean, just comment down below. Is that a part that you don't look forward to in this particular dun dungeon? Because for, for me, that is definitely a part that I do not like. I hate that part. And it usually takes me at least two to three times minimum to try and get to that chest before the flames come back up after you hit that switch. So, <laughs> that is a part of this game I don't really care for, and it usually frustrates me every time I do it. It didn't frustrate me this hard, this time recording so that's a good the YouTube recording curse did not uh, strike this time but I did encounter some troubles like I usually do so now that we got this cool megaton hammer we get to do all sorts of crazy awesome things like uh, destroy pillars uh, knock down floors and walls it is just absolutely amazing and how powerful this hammer is and I think this is the first introduction for this particular type of item Later games give you something similar, either other types of hammers or other items that kind of fulfill same type of uh, qualities as the hammer. But this is where this type of item was first introduced, it was an Ocarina of Time. Yes, thank you, Navi. I know this is rusted. It will not go down by any other means, but literally forcing the darn switch down with the hammer. And this is where that one tip from Agoran had, where if you there's a place where you cannot reach, use your ocarina. So there's a place across the way that we can't reach. Let's use the ocarina and see what's over there. So the camera is not working. It's being weird. That was odd. Where the heck am I? Work with me, camera. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this block is here to help you get across to the other side, and the block was originally was hiding the switch. And I believe this is the second to last Goron you can save in this dungeon. Wow, the camera's wonky. <laughs> and he basically tells you where to go next. Because at this point, you've pretty much explored the rest of the dungeon. You have nowhere else to go. You don't know where the boss key is. You don't know how to get anywhere at this point because you've explored everywhere. You're like, where else can I go? And he's like, oh yeah, go back to the entrance. Now that you have the Megaton Hammer, you probably totally forgot everything about that statue that was there that you could destroy with the Megaton Hammer. What? Yeah, there's a statue there at the entrance. You probably didn't notice it. I didn't notice it either. Probably a lot of other players didn't notice it either. Thankfully, the developers gave this particular Goron to give you that exact hint, and that should. Uh, you should have died. I should have died falling down from the night. But, whatever. Game physics. But thankfully, this Goron tells you exactly where to go for that last key and for that last Goron. So, you want to go down here and probably kill this geese that's going to be coming in, and I think I'm going to stop the video right here. See, there's the statue off to the right. We're going to explore that in the next video. Until then, everybody, see you later.